Okay, here we go again. This is redemptive history. Key passage of the by in the Bible on redemptive history. The the Bible's own self presentation of its meta of the true meta narrative of the world, and we have gone up through um, the Old Testament. I, we left off on Daniel chapter seven, where there's a prophecy about the Son of Man, and now we're finally going to. This is this is part two, where we're going to get to the New Testament. So let's get there. Let's let me open up. Uh, the handouts. Here we are. So this is this is where we left off, Daniel chapter seven. And now let me take us up through Matthew chapter one. This is the beginning of the New Testament. And so here's how it starts. It starts off. And this is why, if you don't think about offspring questions, <laughs> let's go back to Genesis chapter three. You know, so many modern Christians read this like, why, why does that always start? What's with all this genealogy stuff? because it's really important who is the, where the, this, this promise of the offspring. And here he goes, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. Christ is not his name, it's his title. The son of David, there we go. And the son of Abraham, do you see it? So here's his organic history that's unfurling, Genesis chapter three. And then it has to be the son of Abraham, has to be the son of David. <laughs> And then, you know, there's, he's got to be a suffering servant. He must be a son of man. He has to be the king. And so um, this, is the way, this is the way I put it. The birth of the promised offspring of Abraham, who is also the son of David, who is also the son of ser suffering servant, who is also the son of man, who is, all of these are ways of describing the Messiah, the Christ. Okay. So this is all of that in that one simply, seemingly very simple first sentence. You know what's all there? It's all unpacked, the unfurling of redemptive history that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, 15. And so um, this is maybe a good place as any. All throughout the history of Christianity, people have tried to break the New Testament from the Old Testament. Um, you've had heretical thinkers who tend to think that the Old Testament is not even important. We can just dismiss this, you know. Um, or you've had some people who just, who, who always like to just use the Bible, who cherry pick the Bible. And again, you know, in previous videos i told you don't cherry pick the bible you know don't think you can cut out these parts these are the parts that are not necessary as soon as you do that you take the word of god which god gave us and we turn it we turn god's plans god's history into some kind of like false false uh you know i told you before that we're turning you know, the word of god and the, the word that's sp spoken from that we're turning him into a false image a false god a kind of step for god so what people have done then is then they cut up the bible and they take out certain words and verses and you know what they're doing they're producing shall i put it this way a stepford history a stepford you know meta narrative not god's you know presentation of the grand story grand narrative of history but it is a stepford one it's a false one that's what heretics have done. And then, of course, people who, aren't, who don't even you know, claim to be Christians, but they seem to think they think we have the key to the Bible. And so whether they were Gnostics in the past or, you know, people have some strange screwball understanding of their political ideologies, which is like in the Middle Ages or some other time. And then more recently, more like Marxist ideologies. And they think they have the key, the hermeneutical key to the Bible or a feminist key to the Bible, or as I said, a kind of like um, prosperity doctrine theology key to the Bible, and then they cherry pick. So if you really want the Bible's understanding of its history, and we don't get a Stepford history, a Stepford, you know, salvation history, but the true redemptive history, you have to follow the Bible's own presentation. So, you know, and I'm just giving you the key to understanding, like, this is why the New Testament opens up the way it does. So, then it goes to what seemingly incredibly boring, but it's actually tremendously important. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Well, see, like there was almost a point where there was no Isaac. And God had to promise, he's like, no, it's going to come through this woman, Sarah, Genesis chapter 17. God had to covenant himself, Genesis chapter 15. And then in Genesis chapter 22, God does this extraordinary thing where he says, okay, since you really, you know, trust me, why don't you sacrifice Isaac to me? And it says in the book of Hebrews that, that um, the Abraham reasoned that God would raise Isaac from the dead because God 
covenant that promised that it has to come through the seed that would come from Sarah and Sarah that they only had one kid and that was Isaac. So if he killed Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, all of this whole redemptive historical promise, the first gospel promise, the proto evangelion Genesis chapter 350 is hanging in the balance in Genesis chapter 22. It's not just a personal story between God and Abraham, is God going to fail this? Like it's, it's strange because God made this covenanted promise in Genesis 12, and then he, then he covenants himself in 15, and then he's saying, well, why don't you sacrifice Isaac? It's all, the, all of redemptive history, all of God's salvation plan, and his promise that goes back to Genesis. Genesis 3.15, you understand, is at stake in Genesis chapter 22 when God says you can sacrifice Isaac. So all that is in play in these very simple words, Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac, the father of Jacob. And then now the redemptive history is unfurling. Okay, so of course it all culminates. It takes us through, that's why, and then it even gives you um, some important breaks to understand the history. You know, they say there's four, the key is not exactly that there's exactly 14 generations. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of literary way that the Bible is talking about the perfections of God. Seven is such an important number, right? And so, here it's up through, you know, Abraham, Abraham through David, and then David through, and then Israel is destroyed. This is, you know, um, the deportation to Babylon. And then finally, so Israel itself as a nation is destroyed, but the promises of God cannot be stopped. That's important. So this promise of offspring is still happening. You could see this, you know, this, uh, this uh, drama unfurling. And then we finally get to this. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, took place in this way. And then he even goes on to say, um, you know, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, verse 21, for he will save his people from, this, from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive, and this is, you know, this goes all the way back to the um, prophecy from Isaiah. So this is why now the offspring has come, and this great promise is now being fulfilled. So Jesus fulfills, he is, he is the king. He is the suffering servant. And then he conquers sin and death by the cross and through the resurrection. And now he's the risen Messiah, the commission of the risen. And now how is this, this fulfilling is still going to continue. And how is it going to, what he does is now he's the king. He's not a political king. He's not like the beast's of the former empires who has to now going to pull up a political reign. And then you know, now he's got to, you know, he's got to, uh, instead, he's going to have people who is going to follow him and he's going to make them disciples of all nations. Again, back to you know, Daniel chapter seven, where, you know, um, the son of man is going to be over all the peoples or Genesis chapter 12, where Abraham's seed is going to bless all the families of the earth. I, I told you all the tribes, all the nations of the earth. So go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. When the end of this age, when finally I will like, you know, heal all things. So, you know, this is known as the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 25. Let me take you to an important verse, an important passage at, toward the end of the Gospel of Luke. So, the end of the Gospel of Luke. Again, this is the risen Messiah. Jesus is risen. He's risen from the dead. He's teaching those who are following him. He says, and he says this, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And so... Um, the Israelites are confused. They always thought that there's going to be a conquering hero, a conquering king, and that seems to make sense because there's the promise of the Son of Man. Jesus himself calls himself, that is the figure he calls himself, Son of Man is very pregnant with meaning, and so when he calls himself Son of Man, I'm sure he understands that they think, well, isn't doesn't that go back to Daniel? And then that means you're the one, you're the one who's going to be the one who's going to defeat and you know um, all the beasts and then you know, a reign of a dominion of a kingdom that lasts forever over all nations, over all kingdoms. But here he is. See, he, it was necessary that the Messiah, the Christ, has to suffer these things and then enter into his glory. And then here's, this is a really important verse, verse 27. 
of Luke 24, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, in other words, through the Old Testament, <laughs> he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So here's this one tremendously important verse. You know what it's saying? So Jesus then interpreted the Old Testament and showing them that he's the key to the Old Testament. All the scriptures, so it says all the scriptures is the Old Testament. All the scriptures is pointing to himself. <laughs> and what is he essentially doing here? What he's doing is he's essentially offering them what I'm, I'm giving you a kind of teaching of this, which is the redemptive historical understanding of the Old Testament, which culminates in the grand proclamation of the gospel, the good news that the one that was promised in Genesis 3.15 has finally come and he has accomplished all that the Bible has said that he would accomplish. He, he's accomplished these things and all these things point to him. So where do we get this redemptive historical hermeneutic, this Bible self-proclamation and understanding of the Bible that which culminates in Jesus? Let me tell you where what the Bible says, where it comes from. It comes from Jesus. Jesus gives us this understanding and he taught it to his his disciples, and then later on it was taught, and then the and those first ultimate authorized leaders, some were his followers, and some were the first generation of those followers. We call them the apostles, and the New Testament hangs on the apostolic authority of the understanding of all of the meta narrative of history, and it was written down so that the New Testament thus completes the promises of the Old Testament. That's why it's properly, all of scripture has to have the New Testament and the Old Testament, and this understanding of the Old Testament, there's redemptive historical key, this meta-narrative, meta you know where it comes from? Jesus, okay? It's very important. So now I just want to take you kind of to the end and to, just to give you a sense, you know, of course there's more you know, in Acts, or, you know, there's another redemptive historical presentation. There's other ones. I could have given you Peter's sermon, um, but I, what I really want to do is just kind of close out um, two passages in the book of Revelation and this, and uh, and you can really see how Jesus is the completion here, and um, so we clearly know that the Son of Man has not destroyed all the beasts. We're still living in a time, and it says in Daniel chapter seven there will be a time when you know this the, the there's going to be a time where the beasts will be allowed to uh, you know roam the earth. Well, this is still we're still in this time where. The empires of the earth are still like beasts destroying and oppressing others. They're like lions that devour the sheep, you know, wolves that devour the sheep. And so the lamb is the one who is really the lamb of God, the suffering servant, the son of man promised in Daniel chapter seven is finally going to come and co consummate and complete all history. So sometimes the way... Um, scholars who have studied the Bible carefully said this, that the kingdom of God has come. When Jesus came, he inaugurated the kingdom and he is himself is a king, but the full consummation of the kingdom has not come. The kingdom has been inaugurated, but not yet consummated. And we know who the son of man is, and yet the full fulfillment of when all the nations, and there'll be one final kingdom that will in one final dominion where he who is better than Adam, Adam was supposed to be the one who had dominion over all of Christ, but the, there's a man who is coming, who is a seed of Adam and Eve, who is from Eve, who is the promised one, who will then have the final dominion. And finally, all things will be at peace and all nations will be under him. And he will have destroyed all, he will have destroyed all the beasts. He will have destroyed and finally fulfilled what Genesis chapter 3, 15 said, which is crushed the head of the devil and all the followers of the devil, who is the offspring of the devil, Genesis chapter 3, 15, what the, now the, 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 the promised offspring, who is Jesus, and then there will be a spiritual offspring that come from Jesus. And then they will reign over and there'll be a kingdom of God that will reign over and they'll be lasting forever and ever of peace. So here we go in Genesis, um, in Revelation is the promise of the fulfillment of what was prophesied in the Old Testament. So here we go of Genesis. I want you to think about Daniel chapter seven um, as I read this. So uh, let's see, here it is, verse 12. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, then this is John who is offering this prophecy. I saw this vision. Let me tell you what it is. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. 
I won't get hung up in that. Seven, seven is the perfect number. Seven golden lampstands is like these lampstands are going to shine light on all of history. Okay, it's like the perfect shining of of uh, of the completion of all of the, the meaning of history. Right. And in the midst of the lampstands, one here we go, like a son of man. This Revelation chapter one is very, very intentionally echoing Daniel. Even John is a prophet. He's like giving like a prophetic word like Daniel, like Daniel saw a grand vision and there was a mystery with all these strange figures. And the book of Revelation is pretty similar. Um, but here he's showing you a pointing to one. There is verse 13 in the midst of the lab stands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, and with a golden sash around his chest. And it goes on to say, um, in his right hand, he holds seven stars, you know, the, all the stars, the completion, the perfection of all the stars. From his, uh, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, which is usually the Bible understands of his word. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last the living one, I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Very, very clear. I'm the first and the last and the living one. I'm the first and last. That's like saying I'm God, but behold, I'm alive. I have died. And so we clearly know this is Jesus. <laughs> he was a, like a man who had died, but he's alive, but yet he's also divine. I'm the first and the last. And I have the keys of death and Hades. And so all that is of death and hell, I'm going to conquer. This is what, but here now, one like the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? It's Jesus. So Jesus came first in the inauguration of the kingdom to suffer for us, and then to inaugurate the kingdom, and then to call forth those who belong to the kingdom. But it's not a political kingdom. It's not going to be like the beasts of the empires. But He's still the son of man, and yet the final consummation of the work of the son of man, where he will destroy all his enemies, has not yet come. And this is yet coming in, his second, in the second coming of Christ. So we're living in, the, the, in, in this twilight in between of the inauguration and the consummation of the kingdom. And we're calling forth people to follow Jesus as king, to be a part of his kingdom, to be a part of the forever lasting kingdom when Jesus finally heals all of creation and all the beasts will be crushed under his feet. So last, last passage before we complete here. And so recently I, I preached this before you when I preached a message on the second coming of Christ. You know, at the beginning of this year, I gave a message on Advent and I specifically preached on the Advent, the second coming of Christ. And I preached again out of Revelation 1 and I also talked about Revelation 19. I want to take you, you know, we, I, 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 I showed you this, there's verse 13. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure were following him on white horses and from his mouth came a sharp sword which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, um, he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the almighty and on his robe and on his side he will, he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Jesus came first to be a suffering servant, to take away our sins, to be a lamb of God, to shed his blood, to forgive us of our sins and then invite us into his kingdom. But when he comes again, he's going to be like the son of man who's going to come in fury to in judgment and destroy all his enemies and, and to bring the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. But then I want you to, I want to, I want to go on. Verse 19, I want to, you know, just for the sake of time, verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. Here, the beast is a representative of the spirit of an antichrist. Of The beast is like the representative of the powers of the devil. And and the one that was opposed to Christ, the one that was opposed to the reign of the offspring that comes from Abraham, the true Messiah. And here now one is coming. To, I saw a beast. And verse 20, and the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. So this is something that's going on again and again in history. People receiving a mark 
from the beast. So we gladly want to bow down to the ideologies and the powers of the earth and who, who regularly hate God and the name of God. And one day the son of man will come to crush them and destroy the beast. These two were thrown into the lake of fire that burns us up. That is the beast and its prophet. That is the devil. All those who follow the devil, the prophets of the devil, are now finally be destroyed. This is the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3, where the offspring of Adam and Eve, who is the special one, who will bruise his, he will crush his head, right? His head. He will, he, the devil will bruise his heel. That's a reference to the cross. But the one, this offspring will bruise his head and will crush him. And here it is finally in, in Revelation 20. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh on its a violent and, and um, fearful image, but here, here we go. And then we get to Revelation 20, 21. I mean, it's like a glorious ending. So let's like just stop. I mean, just say a couple things to culminate. If you walk through part one and part two, I've just given you the Bible's own meta narrative. It I said it to you very simply before in a, in a, in a simplistic fashion, creation, fall, redemption, recreation, renewal of all creation. But it all points to a good news, a particular news. There's a proclamation that it's done through God's son, Jesus. Who is God's son, Jesus? He is the promised offspring. He's the son of Abraham, the son of David. He has to be the suffering servant. He has to be the lamb of God. He has to be, he has to be the root of, you know, he has to be the stump of Jesse, Isaiah chapter 11. And so you can see it in Matthew chapter one, that, you know, Isaiah chapter 11, it's going to be, this special one's going to be the stump of Jesse. And then it has to come out of Jesse, which is to mean to come out of David. It's going to be a son of David. And then he's going to be the son of man. And he's going to be a conquering son of man. All these, you know, when, we, when we're talking about the gospel, it's a proclamation of this person, Jesus, and what he has done for us to redeem and then heal all of history and creation, which we could not have done for ourselves. It was promised by God and fulfilled in Christ. This is the good news. The good news is that all the promises of God are fulfilled. That history, which is utterly so horrible and broken that we're under, you know, the oppression and the lies of the devil and that we regularly want to follow the devil. Instead, this world that we're living in, where, where human beings regularly want to be like the children of the devil. Instead, that special offspring has come to heal us and bring about the healing of the whole world. So brothers and sisters, I know we still live in a, you know, the world still has sin. And our society is rejecting us. In fact, our, our society is like, they regularly like to follow after the prophet of the devil because the devil is going around saying, we're the new Babylon and we're the new, and we're going to, you know, come up with special justice, social justice, as they call it. And, and often it's always going to continuously fail. The communists fail, you know, the, the, the medieval times failed, the, 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 all, all the other beasts of history have failed. And yet the son of man, who is the son of God, the offspring, that whose good news that we proclaim, he will not fail. So the, the gospel is in one sense, a simple message that any, you know, like a child could understand, but underlying this is this complex, profound story that takes you, that swallows up the whole Bible. The whole Bible is culminates in the gospel. The gospel points you to the whole of the Bible. And what I did was I, I, want, I want to take you through these key passages in these two um, videos to really get you a picture of the understanding of the whole Bible. And I hope you've enjoyed it and hope you, it gives you tremendous awe and gratitude for the gospel. The gospel is the way to, to understand the Bible and the world. And at the same time, the Bible and the world, you know, is, is, all, is all underlined in, in, in this one relatively seemingly simple message, the gospel. Thanks.